Welcome to Meet Your Neighbor. Today we have been invited into the home of Heather Whiteman, a newcomer, in a way, into our town, being here for five years, but Heather has been digging into her surroundings with school presentations, through her activism, through her work for community and public health, and in her commitment to annual triathlons. I'm looking forward to hearing more from Heather. Hi, Heather. Thank you for having me in your kitchen today in Hopkinton to be a part of Meet Your Neighbor. Great. Um, Thank you. It's, it's good to be here. It is beautiful here inside your home as well Thank as you. the surrounding, the yard uh, that you have here. Um, and it's winter time and there's snow everywhere. It's, it's just a beautiful, serene surrounding. How long have you been in Hopkinton? We've lived here, myself and my family, for about five years, a little bit more than five years. Uh, so not very uh, long. Yeah, yeah, so newcomers in a sense, and uh, so welcome. In. <laughs> and uh, uh, where did you come from? Oh, very far away? or in No, we lived in just one of the next towns next over. Next town over, and, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and before then, we, my husband and I come from two different parts of the state. Uh-huh, so, but Massachusetts. But Massachusetts, so we're life. both from yeah. Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you have come here uh, as a family and uh, you are sort of digging into the Hopkinton community with children uh, and getting involved in the school as well. Uh, what would you say that, in moving a little bit from um, a couple towns over, what have you found as uh, special that, that you uh, favor or like in particular about living in Hopkinton now? Sure. I mean, part of what brought us here was was the space. So the land we yeah. have um, at that time, we actually had six animals, and wow. so there were four <laughs> cats and two dogs. So um, two not dogs. not uncommon, but it was it was very busy, and we um, we lived in a, a pretty tight space um, where we lived before. So moving here was was partly so that our our animals could roam to you know to some degree, mm -hmm. and um, and as well that. Um, we could just have access to the outdoors. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of time hiking, um, biking, swimming, running. I mean, so th it just was accommodating mm -hmm. for, for what we like to do. Mm -hmm. So you're so very reason. connected with uh, spending your free time outdoors and yes. with your animals too. Yeah, it can be. I uh, mean, it can be, but, but yeah, mostly just with ourselves, whether mm -hmm. we're together or separately, but we, we will spend as much time as we can outdoors. So the winter can be hard mm -hmm. if um, if it's really cold. I mean, we don't cross country ski, but we'd love to. And mm -hmm. if we had more time, I'm sure we, we would try to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, but spending time hiking outdoors um, with crampons or with other sorts of, you know, um, gear is is something that, you know, we um, we wish we had more time to do. Uh -huh. Working as much as we both do can, it can be, be difficult. Well, I know uh, you were uh, recommended by someone who saw you on the stage talking about a different period of your life being across the world in a far distant place. Um, and it sounds like you have been traveling about in previous years in lots of different parts of the earth with crampons always? Uh, not, not always, <laughs> but some. <laughs> uh huh. Um, where I can have tell been you. some of right. the other places in the world? You've sure, been to. sure. I've spent. Um, I mean, I started traveling. My family. We didn't travel actually much at all, and didn't spend almost any time outdoors, mm -hmm. <laughs> except for riding my bike in the neighborhood. But um, but once I, I think I probably was in college. Um, the first time I went on a hike, mm -hmm. let's say by myself. So I wasn't a hiker. I was actually a, a long distance runner. Is what what oh. I did. Um, oh. Uh, starting in college, really, I didn't do much much up until then by way of sports. Um, maybe a little bit of basketball, some softball, but really not not much more than that. But um, but then did a lot of outdoor um, long distance running, and then when I was in my senior year of college, I left um, to live actually in Europe, and so spent some oh. time living in Europe, and spent a lot of time um, backpacking, and as part of that, just the nature of doing that at that age. Mm -hmm. uh, also spent um, quite some time hiking. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated uh, from college, I spent more time just hiking locally. So in uh, the United States, spent a 
time going cross country by car and mm -hmm. stopping all different places with the northern route and then down the western coast and then across the southern border and then up the eastern eastern seaboard and and spent a lot of time um, hiking as well but nothing nothing real um, aggressive or anything mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. uh, but then in my 20s I um, actually was in a really serious car accident truthfully and um, you know and from that spent about four months in pretty intensive recovery and was like what am I doing with my life at this time I was probably 23 years old maybe mm -hmm. maybe 24 uh, and at that time decided I, I wanted to um, really um, dedicate myself to to helping people sort of achieve their potential mm -hmm. um, you know meet their um, needs or you know connect with their interests and so I decided to go to graduate school mm -hmm. in social work and public health mm -hmm. and from there um, finished up with a macro social work degree so I'm not a clinician but macro a macro social work means means uh, very much how to design programs mm -hmm. how to um, connect communities people to whatever programs ultimately that will um, help them reach their potential, help them with whatever their interests, needs that they may have. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, helping systems be more responsive, more engaged in mm -hmm. um, real people's lives, mm -hmm. you know, be more effective. Uh, and for the public health piece of my work, it was social and behavioral sciences was just sort of a perfect fit for a macro social work. Mm -hmm. And so when I finished with that, I had done, as part of my graduate work, some work in Denmark, um, understanding sort of this pure welfare state mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how it meets the, the needs of its citizens. And so understanding the United States and it's um, less than pure welfare design. I mean, naturally it's a competitive uh, healthcare market, very different structure than um, a welfare state. And so when I finished graduate school, I thought, well, what I don't understand is a really a system of developing care. And so for me at that time, having enormous student loans, um, Peace Corps was, was really the, the next best decision for me to be mm -hmm. able to freeze my loans and really be able to learn another language mm -hmm. and ultimately be, be able to learn about a culture that was dramatically different than my own. And with that, I um, was assigned to Guatemala, mm -hmm. which was wonderful because okay. learning Spanish would have been ideal, although you can't choose where you go for Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so I had to be open to that and so mm -hmm. was, was very grateful that I actually got a Spanish speaking country and went to Guatemala. It was a, about a two and a half year um, service period. What I did was public health education, working in the schools, working with parents, working with teachers and, um, and learned a tremendous amount through that experience, mm -hmm. you know, really a tremendous amount came back and was, was very much now, what am I going to do with my life? But while I was there, I spent a tremendous hiking at um, mm -hmm. intensive levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, Guatemala is, I think it's the size of Tennessee. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's a very small state and I think the, it has 30 volcanoes or something wow. like that. So you could go anywhere and find a um, peak to climb. And certainly where I lived, I lived on the Cuchimatani Mountains while I was in Guatemala mm -hmm. for one period of time. And then um, across, well then at another, it was actually, I think the Santa Cruz range was where I spent another piece of my service and so between those two mountain ranges um, did a lot of hiking but then when I finished my Peace Corps assignment I spent a considerable amount of time hiking and backpacking through Central America the rest of Central mm -hmm. America in Costa Rica in Belize in um, Panama and then also in South America wow. and it was there that I actually had my first experience with um, serious um, cramp-on you know, okay. high altitude uh -huh. um, adventure to say the least and, mm -hmm. and was able mm -hmm. to go as high as 20,000 uh, feet, which was exhausting wow. and a lot wow. of work and took, a, it took many weeks of uh, climatization. So yeah. that was intensive, but highly worthwhile um, and really unbelievable. And that was in Bolivia. Wow. I did that in Bolivia. Bolivia, Juana Potosi was the name of the mountain. What was your Beautiful. life like in Guatemala living there between the two mountains, you said? Yeah, I mean, it was... Um, I mean, if you've been to Guatemala, it's a very interesting um, country. It had a long history, about 25, 30 year um, history of genocide. And the peace accords were signed in 1996. Mm -hmm. And I arrived in 1999. Mm. Um, the first town I was assigned to, we actually didn't have a police presence for the first six months that wow. I was there. Mm -hmm. But naturally, um, the police are often former military mm -hmm. um, servants, and so that can get really complicated, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, throughout the world in understanding who to trust and, mm -hmm. you know, what um, the rules are. 
um, and particularly with this this history, which was against the Mayan people, which the Mayan people is a, you know, I think it's a 26 count per, I mean, di for 26 different cultures within the Mayan culture. And so for the wow. two areas that I lived, it was um, the Mam people, M-A-M, mm -hmm. Mam people had their own language, mm -hmm. um, their own way of, of dressing. They wove their own clothing, mm -hmm. their own traje. And so depending upon what they had on and the colors that they wore, you could tell from where they were, so what neighborhood they wow. were from. It was uh -huh. really quite brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, but so while I was there, I mean, you know, Peace Corps really tries to have you live at the level, the majority level. Um, this would be economic level of the people. And mm -hmm. so that meant that um, we received a monthly stipend, very limited amount of money, but enough to be able to rent a room. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to rent, I think it was two, what, three rooms in the first place that I lived and in the second place, it was four rooms which is unusual. Mm. Usually people live with many other people, um, but that just wasn't, wasn't what I chose to do. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to um, afford to have something a little bit larger and have more privacy, mm -hmm. which again is, another, is something that's very unusual. But what did I do? spend my time doing is I very much worked through the morning into the early afternoon. Uh, then I would um, return to my home. I usually would spend time hiking at that point, mm -hmm. mm. a little bit of time socializing with people that lived near me, mm. um, that were friends that lived in, in the area where I lived. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when the sun went down, you know, for a woman that's, you know, you as well, that's when you would reside, you know, to, um, to your home mm -hmm. and you'd make your dinner and then really read probably is what I spent a lot of time doing. And then you sort of go to sleep and then when the sun rises and everything else rises when your day sort of mm -hmm. starts again, mm -hmm. um, starts all over. Uh -huh. So that was kind of really the structure, but yeah. spent, you know, a lot of time engaged with um, with people who lived there around, you know, trying to educate them, mm -hmm. uh, in, the in the way that, you know, I was, what my job was, I mean, mm -hmm. so very much and as a public, public health, health educator, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. basic hygiene and how to ultimately uh, prevent derail disease, mm -hmm. really. And, and this was very important because it was difficult to get past age six at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much mm -hmm. it's changed now because this is now a little bit more than 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but so, yeah, so in any way that you could prevent children from um, getting amoebas or getting giardia or getting other sort of waterborne illnesses, mm -hmm. um, that'd be really helpful to the, you know, general health of the community. Mm. So. so you did a lot of uh, work in educating and uh, in helping to... Uh, raise awareness of public health issues uh, in different ways. And what do you think you took away as a life lesson, one of them maybe, from your time there, one in particular maybe that stands out? I don't know. That's such a great question. Um, I absolutely learned so much more than, than I could ever imagine teaching mm. people that, that um, I was people with. There. Yeah, I mean, I think what... Um, oh, I don't know. I mean... <laughs> I think probably what I probably have a better understanding of than, than anything else is just how simple, and simple isn't even the right word, like I think for, for many of us here, you mm. know, in, in my community, life can be so complicated mm -hmm. in the sense of how busy people are, and in the sense of um, how many different options we have mm. as far as what to do in any given moment with ourselves. Yeah. Um, you know, but this, this actually was very different. You know, when, when in the communities where I was living, I mean, people had a pretty um, structured, regimented life that um, was exhausting in many ways. Um, you know, people um, were going similar to us from the second they woke to the second they would sleep, but it was doing things that would be like preparing a meal. Is It would be very long and, and sort of, you know, um, interesting process. Um, cleaning your clothing, I mean, as well for myself, you'd wash all of your clothing by hand, mm -hmm. which would take several hours. Mm -hmm. And certainly if you had more than one person like myself, if you had typically you had three to five or six people living in your home, um, you know, so that, that would take a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you worked in the fields, that would be the whole day process, both spending perhaps one or two hours walking to where you worked and then as well working and then walking back. Um, I would spend easily two hours one way walking to some of the schools where wow. I was assigned. Wow. Um, this is, you know, walking not just on a paved road, nothing was paved at all where I lived, but um, 
but it would be up and down the mountainsides. You mm. know I mean, so mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's just a different way Very of different. sort of living your day to day. Mm. Yeah, so really appreciated um, time spent, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's just sort of in the moment as much as, much as possible. Mm -hmm. So I have a better appreciation for that, I think. What would you say in getting to know people there, a contributing factor to happiness is something you observe there. What, in seeing the people that you met yeah. and those that were it, happy in a very different, sure. hard by our right. observation kind of lifestyle. Yeah. Um, what would be meaningful? No, it, would, or a, it would be so dependent upon the person. I mean, like mm -hmm. any place probably, but um, yeah, it would be, it, it would just so depend, you know, mm -hmm. for one person, just living to the next day was actually quite, you know, for some of the older mm -hmm. men that were that were working really hard physically, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that would, you know, that would be um, really important for some of the women, you know, it would, um, it could be, you know, having a, just a, a joke with some friends during, you know, having a coffee at one of their houses or something like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, it kind of would just depend on the person, just just like, you know, just like for mm -hmm. any of us, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. Really, depending on the person, I would say that it wasn't necessarily a happy culture. I didn't mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. that per se. Mm -hmm. um, it was, no, that's it was a lot of, you know, and it was very much the again where I was placed, coming out of a long civil war. So, um, mm -hmm. or excuse mm -hmm. me, genocide. So, so hard it, time it was really hard there. time. Yeah, I mean, it was not necessarily. No, yeah, yeah. It was, it was yeah, an intense time. Yeah, it was there. intense yeah. time. I think for mm -hmm. everyone. You well, know, I know that. then that you have recently, as I mentioned, been on the stage over at the middle school in Hopkinton right. and talking about that experience um, to the middle school, school students. Yeah. Um, did you have a particular uh, point uh, for this talk? Yeah, I mean, that was a good question. Um, I probably didn't know exactly what their age would be as interested in as, as um, other age. I have worked. So when I came, returned from the Peace Corps, I did work with middle school age students for a number of years. And so understanding that, I was like, okay, hmm, Hopkinton, fairly homogeneous group likely, probably not many travelers. Who knows if they're even gonna know where Guatemala is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's no disrespect, not in an ignorant mm -hmm. way, but just in, in sort of um, a youth, like just their mm -hmm. youthfulness mm -hmm. and potentially, um, just, just in that regard. Um, and so I spent a lot of time talking about uh, the artistry, really, of the people, which oh. was their weavings, their mm -hmm. weavings of their clothing all over the, you know, these northwestern highlands, because again, this is where most of the indigenous people live. Mm -hmm. So not on the shore, not in the capital, not in some of the tourist areas, but in these mountainous regions. And they were, I, think I was surprised at how interested they were in mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And the feedback that I got when I left was, Actually, that they were um, were actually just really impressed with um, the detail to that, and I mm -hmm. mean the detail is amazing, mm -hmm. amazingly beautiful. And um, I can get some before we before uh -huh. we finish if uh -huh. you want. I can show you, but it's really mm -hmm. quite um, stunning. And the students stunning. were especially impressed yeah, with especially hearing impressed. of that work. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean some of the you know poverty indicators and other sorts of public health indicators. They were. Um, I didn't really know how to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. just, just the being fear. very different. Being very different, mm -hmm. yeah, and the importance of learning another language. Um, I don't know. You know, it's uh -huh. hard to know if anything like that kind of came through service. It was hard to know. I mean, there was mm -hmm. mostly, you know, it's kind of a range of, of um, I don't know, wisecracks and other sort of things that that age does mm -hmm. as you're sort of entering puberty and trying to make sense of your place in, in mm -hmm. this all. So, you know, hmm. yeah. Well, uh, it, I, it sounds like it was. Uh, it's all a, good. A helpful, yeah, important was, door opening kind of. It could have been. Talk person, you provided. Yeah. Uh huh. And uh, good and brave of you uh, to yeah. offer out. And As well sounds like you've had a lot of brave moments in your life, kind of with a sense of adventure and risk in Absolutely. working towards what you believe in and mm -hmm. uh, a bit of activism. Um, in wherever you go, and uh, so you've been to Guatemala and around the world in different places, hiking and for work, and then you make your way back here to the Metro West uh, to live and uh, and to work. Mm -hmm. um, 
because you ha are no longer a part of global uh, public health, but focusing more recently in work right around here. You have come from mm -hmm. some work in the New England sure. area. Yeah, uh, and I can, can tell you, you talk about, about that, that a little sure. bit. So, um, so like I said, did youth development uh, working in Worcester, actually, in two public schools for a bit of time right after I returned from the Peace Corps and did that for about three and a half years or so. And that was for what? Yeah, I worked with the YMCA mm -hmm. of Greater Worcester. I think it's actually the YMCA of Central Mass now. Mm -hmm. um, but worked with the Citizen Schools program, so it's an initiative based in Boston. They were mm -hmm. expanding their program model outside of the city of Boston. I had the opportunity to be in charge of one of their first pilot sites. Mm -hmm. um, was, it was Worcester, Framingham, San Jose, California, and Houston, Texas, and we were the first set of pilot sites. And that was a really, um, I would say, good experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Citizen Schools has a very interesting community development piece to their work that really asks all of us, uh, you know, regular people, regular citizens, to come into the afternoon classroom and teach whatever our skill or passion is mm -hmm. um, to middle school age students. So it was really provocative mm -hmm. and uh, meaningful. Mm -hmm. You know, and from there, I um, towards the end of that, I learned um, newly about something you know very um, difficult, and and has led me to the work that I'm doing most recently. But um, but this was back now, probably seven, eight years ago. Very much um, learning about child slavery. You know, mm -hmm. so the buying and selling of children throughout the world, but but in the United States, and so. Um, with that understanding, I sort of made it my interest to learn as much as I could about that issue here in Massachusetts and followed that over many, many years. Went to work for the Department of Public Health under the Division of Violence and Injury Prevention. This was a teen suicide prevention grant that I managed at that time. Really interesting work, um, met a lot of interesting people working between um, two departments, State Department's Department of Children and Families and the Department of Youth Services, then Department of D Department of social services that now is the Department of Children and Families, mm -hmm. and DYS, mm -hmm. and the Graduate Schools of Social Work. Uh, and you know, through that experience, continued to learn more about homelessness prevention and, um, and very much violence against children, and particularly against girls and women. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so worked for a community action agency, worked managing a domestic violence shelter here in Massachusetts. Um, and then more recently, really have become part of a volunteer initiative at this point mm -hmm. towards helping to think through how to help adult women come out of, emerge out of a life of commercial exploitation. And so there's a lot of work forward, but, um, but no doubt wow. it's mm -hmm. a really powerful uh, initiative and, um, and, is, and it is about all of us, I mean, as far mm -hmm. as, you know, my experience, you know, and helping to learn as much as we can about how complex what I see is a public health experience, public health um, problem mm -hmm. that um, mm -hmm. happens around us and no one, no one has, some people have a real clear sense of it, other people don't have a sense, sense mm -hmm. of it. And, um, and we could all probably do a better job of um, understanding just how difficult it is sometimes mm -hmm. for a whole range of people. Wow, Heather. <laughs> yeah, so with that, uh -huh. I feel like I, <laughs> I spent a lot of my of, time. <laughs> uh, in a way, uh, you know, we had this uh, gentle beginning and talking about you and your love of travel, which is maybe how it all started, but sure. also this uh, deep, uh, ingrained sense of uh, reaching out, wanting to help and connect with others all Absolutely. over the world, and now more locally and uh, look into ways that there is great need for. Uh, people and and children, women, uh, right. all those in need, and it, it certainly sounds like you have been digging in deep with uh, crampons in a way as a metaphor, um, and you're you really have been doing some um, really important work for our world. Um, sure. And uh, so thank you. I, I want to say that. Uh, and so how do you find? Uh, time and means to help yourself in helping the world. You have family and you have a home Sorry. and uh, you're transitioning and work. Uh, so what uh, helps you in all of this uh, that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean connections, I would say, to people that are like-minded. So I um, spend a lot of time cultivating those relationships and mm -hmm. so um, that makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, I have um, a core group of people I spend you know, I've known for many, many years that, um, that we've grown together in sort of understanding better 
how to be and serve and mm -hmm. and uh, make sense of it all because mm -hmm. it's not easy nobody has all the answers i certainly don't mm -hmm. but um but it's it takes all of us i guess yeah you know yeah. so i really appreciate being part of of this as i said this work with um mm -hmm. this group of volunteers recently because it's it's really um it's got a long way to go mm -hmm. but it's it's all it's all good mm -hmm. it's all good wow. And so connections, uh, obviously yes. important in your work, important in your own mm -hmm. uh, life. And also, uh, do you have a triathlon coming up as, <laughs> as we end this interview? But just uh, so happen, you might have one of those sure. on the horizon. Yeah, there, there's um, usually every summer there's uh, a group of us that will compete in just the sprint triathlon, so the short distances. But um, they're very... They're very hard mm, for us mm -hmm. and take a lot of time and energy training of which I need to get in the pool and God help me <laughs> swim. <laughs> um, it's not my favorite part of the triathlon. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you do it still. But yeah, yeah I do it. Anyways, uh -huh. It's all good. It's all good exercise. Good goal. Highly recommend it. Uh -huh. You know, wow. I was someone who didn't swim actually very much at all and had to really had to really learn uh -huh. that part. Uh -huh. and, um, when I first decided to do these. That's so, no easy it. task. No, it isn't. Uh, uh, <laughs> like a lot of what you take on, so. Well, well no, I mean. Best wishes on yes, the next sure. triathlon. Maybe we'll you'll be, do it with me. Well, uh, maybe I'll start by cheering. <laughs> maybe another time. Maybe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, have a good experience. And sure. thank you so much for your Absolutely. time and your interview today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Hi, I'm Cheryl Peralt, host of the program Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. This show introduces you to Hopkinton residents, the many interesting people who are our neighbors, and we invite them to share stories, experiences, insights, and observations from their lives. We'd like to hear who you think should be interviewed on our program. So if you know someone that Hopkinton should get to know more about, please email me and stay tuned for more episodes of Meet Your Neighbor on HCAM TV. HCAM TV showing movies? That's right. Dive and Drive is a new show on HCAM. Join Mike and I as we present some B movies. Movies that have piqued the two Mike's interest. And not to mention, they're also free. We'll give you some interesting tidbits about the cast and crews. And point out some of the reasons these are classic B films. So check out the HCAM TV website at HCAM.TV for movie days and showtimes.